We will now start the uh, panel discussion on innovation, investment and productivity, chaired by Peter Pratt. And during the two panel discussions today and starting now, you'll have the possibility to actively participate in the debate by answering live some questions posed by the chairs. So just to make sure that you have your iPads in front of you, if you go on the polling menu, you will have one minute to answer the questions, after which the results will be shown on the screens to uh, further the debate. And we will be doing that during this and the next panel. And I now would like to give the stage to Peter. So um, this, is, this is the first uh, panel session. I have been asked to introduce the participants here very briefly, so let me do that. Uh, this is a very atypical uh, panel for me because I don't know you, actually. I never interacted <laughs> with you in, in panels, which is usually not the case. And I'm very curious about what you're going to say. I think so this, we innovate with uh, sort of atypical uh, persons. That's the first point. The second point, uh, we had a very good start this morning. I have in my mind many questions as you, so we have to keep time for the audience to ask these questions. Uh, things which didn't come very much in the discussions, for example, in the labor market is skills versus talent, and uh, I would like at some point also to ask questions about this. Now, uh, I also was struck by David this morning. David, uh, when you made this distinction between history versus science fiction, and that gave me history versus science fiction. So I think that gave me a good idea for the sequence of this panel. So we, talk, we, we start with economic history, with an economic historian. Uh, Joel, you science fiction. Then Mar Mariana, you will follow with Reinhilde, and then we finish, I don't know if you take it badly or positively, with Hull and uh, more science fiction right. sort of person. Right. So we get the two extremes, and the uh, more, I guess, reasonable persons in between. That's <laughs> the two ladies here. Very welcome, and uh, very pleased to see you here. So uh, 10 minutes, and uh, yes, will be challenging, uh, and there is a clock there, so you can, and I, I will uh, <laughs> discipline you. I'm sorry for that. So Joel? And uh, please. Thank you. Uh, so as Peter said, I'm an economic historian. Uh, I'm going to take a very long run view. So I'm not going to talk about you know, investment and, 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 and things like that. In fact, I want to talk about only one topic. And that actually goes to the subject of history versus uh, science fiction. So I want to address a, a literature which I sort of call techno-pessimism. Mm -hmm. And techno-pessimism comes in sort of two main varieties. One is what I call the techno-stagnationist, people who believe that all the sort of low-hanging fruits have been picked, that you know, we've invented antibiotics and air conditioning and smartphones and so on, but we can never invent them again, and so obviously uh, things are going to slow down now, and uh, eventually we'll sink in some kind of stationary state, and, 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 and w life will get very boring. And then there are the techno-dystopians, of people who actually think the technological change will be so fast that artificial intelligence and machines will basically take over the planet. They will all end up in some kind of Kurzweilian singularity. Or maybe some of you may remember a Kurt Vonnegut's player piano written in the 1950s in which nobody's working and, and life is terribly depressing and, 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 and awful and, and so on. So these are these two different techno-pessimists. And so the good news is they can't both be right. <laughs> the better news is they can both be wrong, and they are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so um, let me sort of give you a, sort of a bit of an economic history view on that. And what I want you to think about is some kind of an imaginary regression. I'm not going to run this regression because I don't know what data to put in it, but we can still do this mentally. And you think about this kind of regression as you put something on the left-hand side that you may call technological progress, innovation, productivity, growth, whatever, and then you stick in a bunch of right-hand variables that you think may have mattered to technological change in the past, and, um, and you go, um, how about if we took the beta hats and plugged it in today's values, what would that predict? Now, I want to warn you that that is probably not, you know, not the best way to do this, simply because if you run some, some regression, you assume a fixed structure. And if we've learned anything, it is that the Industrial Revolution and the subsequent technological changes constitute what physicists would like to think of as a phase transition. That's to say the whole structure of the model changes. The way technological progress occurs now is very different than it did in the 17th century, or even during the period of the Industrial Revolution. 
Uh, that said, I'm going to do it anyway, and then you know, if, it, if, the, if the model is wrong, uh, so be it. But at least we'll give you some kind of indication of the things that have mattered in the past. And the central argument I'm going to make is something like that. So technology is knowledge, and it's based on knowledge. But what that really means is that when we invent something, when we, make, when we build some kind of new gizmo and then patent and so on, it's based on something, on, on some knowledge base, which I've called an epistemic base. And that basically means that do you actually know why the damn thing that you're building is working? And we can think of many inventions that were made over, through history in which people got something to work, but they had no clue why it worked. And what's happening, of course, in modern times is that we understand more and more about why things work. We never know absolutely everything, but we know a hell of a lot more uh, about mechanics or you know, biology, you know, molecular biology, um, you name it, that explains why the world is. And we can use technology that's based on that. Of course, the more you know about something, the more likely it is that the technology will work properly. But the question is, what kind of knowledge does there exist between the science that underlies our technology? And, um, the word science is a bit ambiguous here, but leave that alone. And uh, here's what I'd like to propose. It's not only true that you need science to get technology to work. Technology feeds back mm -hmm. into science. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's often neglected. Also, my, the late Nathan Rosenberg, my dear friend, uh, um, wrote a very famous paper about this. And basically, the point is that if scientists have better tools to work with, Okay, science will move faster. In fact, we can explain most scientific revolutions by the tools that scientists work with. The classic case, of course, is the, quote, scientific revolution of the 17th century, which was to a large extent mm. driven by the well, invention of lens grinders who came up with microscope, came up with telescope, barometers, vacuum pumps. I mean, I can give you a longer list, but you get the idea. And that is what produced people like Galileo and Hooke and, and so on and so forth, and you know, making science work better, and then a century <laughs> later, you get the Industrial Revolution. In our 20th century, maybe the best example that I can give out of hundreds is um, X-ray uh, crystallography, which is a tool that scientists use. It's, it's helped gain 28 Nobel Prizes in the science, of course, including the development of the DNA, also the person who used it, <laughs> Rosalind Franklin, didn't get the prize. That's a different story. Uh, but it, these are tools that uh, scientists have, the technology makes available to science. Now, you ask yourself, what kind of tools have modern uh, technology made available to science? And it boggles the mind, ladies and gentlemen. These are things that, some of these things we had before, right? So we had telescopes before, but surely Galileo <coughs> would never have dreamed about something you know, like the new space telescope that's about to launch next year, or the Hubble, or any of these things. You look at microscopes, yes, Yes, Robert Hooke had a microscope, but compared to a basic hell micro, you know, a, a, a microscope, this is like a toy. But we have tools that nobody in the past even dreamed about. You start with lasers. I mean, the lasers, we use them in daily life, but people don't fully realize how much of a revolution laser has made in scores of investigative fields. Or you look at what computing has done to science. I mean, forget what computers have done to productivity. We've talked about that. And, and, but think about what computers are doing to our ability to discover science. I mean, we have an entirely new field that have computational X, biology, physics, chemistry, you name it. These fields would have been unimaginable. We can simulate equations you know, that people have known about for centuries and could never solve, and now we simulate them. And as quantum computers are gonna come online, hopefully after 30 years of waiting, it'll finally come online, we can do this faster and faster and faster. So what I'm suggesting basically is that modern technology is gonna pull itself up by the bootstraps using its impact on science. And that's an indirect effect that modern technology has on productivity that's very difficult to calculate because actually these, it, it may cross fields in ways that we can't even imagine, but this is uh, what's going to happen. All right, so that's, that's dependent variable number one. Here's another dependent variable, incentives. Okay, we're all economists. We understand about incentives. Now, what kind of incentive structure do we have that drives uh, science and technology? We basically know the story, right? 
Uh, technology is largely driven by people trying to make money, whether they make money through the patent system, which doesn't work too well, but hey, you know, we can imagine worse. Uh, but there are other things that, uh, uh, that we incentivize technology, first mover's advantage, secrecy, you know, blah, 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 the whole thing. Now, did this exist in the, you know, 300 years ago? The answer is yes, the patent system did exist in some countries. It was not very well, working very well, but it was working to some extent, worked okay. Bigger question, how do we incentivize the people who produce the science? Mm -hmm. And there the problem is difficult because there actually, you know, no rare, very rarely does a scientist capture anything of the social surplus that the science produces. So what do we do? We have devised a system which we call reputation mechanism. Okay, and we, you know, every academic in the world plays that game. You know, you don't do it for the money, you do it for the reputation. Now, reputation is kind of nice because it's correlated with what they're called in the 17th century patronage. I've written a book about that. And we don't call it patronage, we call it tenure, but hey, you know, it's the same thing. <laughs> uh, uh, but it is about reputation. You sit in a tenure decision, you realize what's going on. People look at what, what are people think about your work. Now, so I wrote a book about these reputation magazines in the 17th century. You know, it, it starts in the 17th century. But what they had was nothing compared to what we have today. We have a huge system of, of, of incentives. It's not just tenure. It's named professorships. It's prizes of membership in learned academies. I mean, you name it. We have Number perfected five. this system. So the scientists today work harder than ever, and they work basically all to maximize the reputation. And the nice thing, of course, that globalization much more now than in the 17th century, is, it has, means that you have a global reputation. And that, of course, does yield certain, certain uh, phenomena like winner take all and so on and so forth. But basically, everybody understands that. And so what I foresee is that science is continue to thrive. Don't ask me where it's going, because that takes me to science fiction, not to, well, I can give you a list of things where I think it, it might be going. Basically, if I had to make give any prediction I would follow uh, uh, Freeman Dyson's prediction that if the 20th century was the century of physics, the 21st century will be the century of biology. I think our ability to manipulate life on this planet by CS, cast with C or maybe more advanced gene editing technology is gonna, is gonna truly be a, an epochal invention that we will be able to design the kind of life forms that we need to cope with a changing mm. environment. Mm. That is, I think, the great uh, 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 future that I see have lying before us. That, I don't think, is going to be science fiction. Thank you. So, no, thank you very much. Uh, no, my, my conclusion is, uh, then it's a problem of diffusion, you know, of science uh, in the society, not so much uh, innovation per se. I mean, because you stop, you, you stop there. You, you so give me another ten minutes. I no, no, I don't, I don't, I don't, <laughs> because Mariana, Mariana, I'm, I'm sure, knowing what you write, she's going to pick up, you know, what is the role, in particular, of the state, because you've written a lot on this, uh, but maybe not only on this, but uh, you may make this point, okay. and then we'll go back to, you know, what what's the problem then if you know things are so rosy, and we have some, as you know, some colleagues of you also here in the in the room. May argue, may argue in the I other way. I can't imagine yeah. who you're you talking about. You can't imagine, no. <laughs> so, thanks. It's the problem with passionate people, you know, in panels. You know, it's very difficult because you are so much interested in learning about the, the next. So, but, okay, thanks for the discipline. Uh, Mariana, your turn. And, uh, okay. Great. <laughs> so, how do you address this, this issue now? You know, what's so, the point of attack, yeah. you know, of that? So, I think this session is incredibly important precisely because of the context that was laid out last night, which is that lots of the growth that's been happening over the last decade has actually been consumption-led. So, if we want, well, consumption-led and private debt-led, so I'm sure you all know that the levels of private debt over disposable incomes are back to record levels, and that's what caused the financial crisis in the first place. So, if we want investment-led growth, and if we want that investment to be directed um, and I think that's where this concept of smart growth, innovation-led growth comes from. I think what this panel then is, you know, does, if you want, is give us some insights on how that might occur. And what's extraordinary with economists is that on the one hand, this one sort of area where I really think we all more or less agree in both micro and macro, that innovation is one of the key factors that determines long-run growth, then a key area of disagreement is how that innovation actually comes about, and in particular, what the role of public policy is. And I have six quick points that I'll get through in these uh, nine minutes I have left, 
which I want to sort of unpick some of the myths and um, some of the problems, I think, that exist, which are not going to help us get that investment-led, innovation-led growth unless we get over those problems. And the first one is that we have a very useful uh, a framework in economics to justify public policy, which is you have to first identify some sort of market failure um, where you know, it might be the public good problem, so basic research, you need um, government to finance that. It might be asymmetric information, so we need SME financing. It might be negative externalities, so a carbon tax on pollution. But actually, if you look at history, and Joel is an expert here in history, it would be incredibly hard to explain anything that has happened in innovation in terms of big innovation, so general purpose technologies that have really affected productivity across many different sectors, also across production, distribution, and eventually consumption, if we just had that one lens, you know, that the role of policy was fixing some sort of problem, one of those different market failures. Again, very useful framework, but very uh, limited also in terms of guiding future innovation policy. So that first point is, just the sort of one-liner is, actually what's happened is that the few places in the world that achieved smart innovation-led growth, few regions, even within countries, had policy that was much more about shaping or co-shaping and co-creating markets, not just fixing them. And you know, just the quick sort of way to also describe this is if you look at the type of organizations and their level, the sort of breadth and depth of intervention, um, for example, in Silicon Valley, whether it's the DARPAs, the ARPA-E, the SBIR, the NSF, the procurement programs, the NIHs, you know, their, their breadth and depth was across the entire innovation chain, basic research, applied research, the linkages between them, which Joel was basically highlighting why we need the linkages between them, because innovation is quite serendipitous. The search for one thing often leads to the discovery of another, like Viagra, right? They were looking for one thing and something else popped up. Very interesting history. Um, then early stage, you're supposed to laugh, early stage finance for the few companies, there's actually very few that are often even willing to engage with some big innovation programs. Um, procurement programs, and then also bold demand-side policies. Don't forget that mass production, which was one of the biggest innovations, organizational and technological, would not have had the effect that it did without, for example, suburbanization programs, which were from policy, which actually allowed this new innovation to get fully diffused and deployed throughout the economy. Um, and second, if you actually look at how those innovations occurred and the way that policy interacted, it wasn't saying, oh, let's go after that technology, let's do the internet, or let's do GPS. Often the big innovations, all the ones that are in your smart products, like the internet, GPS, uh, touchscreen display, Siri, voice-activated systems, were uh, spillovers over time, and you need that sort of long-run perspective, of mission-oriented investments, right? So going to the moon is the most classic one, but some of the more interesting ones today are, for example, those directed at the climate change problem. But going to the moon required more than 10 different sectors, including clothing. You couldn't just go there with jeans and a t-shirt. And our ability, actually, to also capture and assess and evaluate, because we often have, you know, have to evaluate these public investments, really must adapt to really capture that full sort of dynamic spillover process, including, by the way, the Concord, which everyone thinks was a failure, but I've never seen one proper article that has captured the full spillovers that came from the Concord investment, right? Um, anyway, these mission-oriented investments are, are quite important, also in terms of capturing the multiplier effect. You know, if you're just doing innovation policy kind of patchy here and there, the effect that it ends up having on the overall growth of the economy is probably less than if you have this more sort of directional push, which also really creates linkages between not just different sectors, but also between manufacturing and services. Third, the actual structure of these investments is incredibly important. This is not just public money thrown out into, you know, a, 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 a two different companies or different areas. The organizational capacity of, you know, organizations like DARPA, ARPA-E, YASMA, this public venture capital fund, providing patient, long-term, committed, strategic finance in Israel, key to the whole startup nation uh, uh, um, dynamic in Israel, what actually happened in those organizations is incredibly important to learn from, right? So they were public but unpolitical. You know, you didn't have a political process getting their hands inside. Same thing, by the way, and Mario probably knows the history of Edi. Edi in Italy had three different phases, very important. It began not very well with Mussolini, but then it had three phases, public, unpolitical, public ultra-politicized, 
um, and then privatized. And the second and the third phase in Italian industrial development were quite problematic. That first phase was incredibly interesting also in terms of their ability to attract the top managers wanted to work in this public entity called EDI in Italy. Same thing in DARPA and ARPA-E, their ability to attract real experts, real scientific experts who think it's an honor to work in these agencies is very much related to their mission orientedness. If they said we are out there simply to de-risk the private sector, to level the playing field, to, uh, uh, um, uh, to fix some sort of market failure, it's not that exciting. And you know, someone like Steve Chu, a Nobel Prize winning physicist who ended up directing the DOE under Obama, you can bet that that was very much because Obama, at least initially, was thinking about directing this 800 billion stimulus program very much in this green direction. Um, and that ability to attract that level of expertise in Europe today, where we like to blame the public sector for everything without admitting just how many problems there are also in the private sector with this incredible inertia, I think is really hurting our ability to reform the public institutions. So again, coming back to Italy, the riforma della pubblica amministrazione is not very much about you know, rethinking how do we develop these dynamic decentralized network of different types of public organizations able to think in the strategic way. Fourth, um, this whole issue of, well, what kind of investment? You know, direct, indirect? Well, of course we need both. But one thing I think internationally is we have too much emphasis on this, these indirect kind of tax incentives. Whether it's the R&D tax credits, which are actually the more smart kind of tax incentives we need, or again, the patent box, which I think is a very bad idea. But anyway, in general, this assumption that business wants to invest, and you just have to facilitate and de-risk that process is simply wrong. Often, you know, and Keynes actually talked about this in a wonderful letter he wrote to Roosevelt in 1932, where he said, mm, we have a problem here. You know, these businesses out there, they're actually not wolves and tigers and lions. They're actually domesticated animals. And so this notion that the animal spirits actually have to be created endogenously through public investments to get business to even want to invest, so through direct investments in nanotech and biotech, in the life sciences, which by the way, preceded the venture capital entry into biotech by 30 years. And then on top of that, add as icing on the cake, but not the cake itself, some sort of tax incentive. That balance is incredibly important because otherwise, all we do through these incentives is, is increase profits. And as we just heard from Thomas, whose work I love, prof, you know, there's no profits problem. Profits are already at record levels. The real problem we have is the investment problem. So how to create additionality, how to get business to invest when it wouldn't have invested anyway is key. And this kind of mix of direct and indirect, but the structure of that direct investment is, is really key to understanding that process. And I wrote a book called The Entrepreneurial State, trying to really understand how that's happened over history. Lastly, because I have one minute left, and because this is a, you know, a conference organized by the ECB, the kind of summary in terms of finance, mm -hmm. I think it's very important. First. There is not a supply of finance problem. There is a demand for finance problem. In fact, SMEs, by the way, and I always get killed by politicians when I say this, are overly financed. <laughs> you know, in the UK, we spend more on SMEs than on the universities, right? Like something like nine billion. There's few SMEs, about four percent, that are even interested in innovating. So either we should just do it for folkloric reasons to finance SMEs, but if we're interested in productivity increases and innovation, we really need to think of mechanisms to pick the willing. Um, and this is independent of size. Second, it's not the quantity of finance, but the quality. Patient, long-term, strategic finance is what is required. And unfortunately, in many countries, we don't have that. Some countries might do it through a public bank, like the KFW in Germany. Some, as I have mentioned already, through Yasma in Israel. Some, like the US, through procurement programs, the SVIR program, which was fundamental to providing early stage finance before VC came. And lastly, and I'm five seconds over, so I'll just say it, Financialization of the real economy is a massive problem. The proportion of share buybacks to R&D spending has escalated and it's getting worse. Apple under Steve Jobs reinvested the profits. Apple under Tim Cook, not. What's the future of innovation in Apple? That corporate governance issue is key to that. Thanks. Uh it doesn't tell us really how you pick up the winners. I mean, what you say, you know, that's... Well, give me another uh, 10 minutes and... Well, well I mean, <laughs> let's welcome in the discussion. Yeah. But I mean, uh, I think it's, very, it's a very sort of credible plaidoyer with, with that provision. I mean, how do, how do you do that? But that's pick correct. Pick directions. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, Heinil, you worked a lot on R&D. Uh, so, uh, what is your view on this? Yeah. 
So uh, you raised a very specific question that we needed to address. So my question was, uh, do we measure productivity uh, well enough to draw really conclusions of do we have a productivity slowdown? I actually took this question to really come from a concern that the innovation machine as a driver of growth was, was in trouble in Europe. And so rather than talking about productivity growth and its measurement through the residual TFP, what we typically see, I would like to immediately turn to innovation and its measurement directly of that to see whether we see the same uh, product, the same downturn, slow turn in uh, innovation when we look at the process directly. But before I do, I want to make two specific points about what's so specific about innovation investments, different from capital investments. Um, and one first important point is that um, innovation, of course, creates in, uh, private welfare for the innovator. That's where the incentives to invest come from. But the really um, full create, creative potential of, of innovation comes from not only the innovator, but also indirectly from the diffusion and the spillovers. And uh, that's not just imitators, but it's uh, others that apply the same idea to new, completely new uh, applications. And that's really where the power of innovation uh, as a growth machine comes from. It's from this diffusion and uh, where you have the social uh, rate of return rather than just the private. And we saw this with uh, the work of, of David Otter very well. Unfortunately, it's, it's much more difficult to measure this diffusion process and particularly to which channels this diffusion actually runs. Um, what we know is that, of course, diffusion requires some kind of codification, uh, but the transfer of know-how is very often embodied in people, uh, in R&D and innovation personnel. And what we know from micro uh, evidence is that lots of these spillovers actually come from transfer of people that move uh, within firms to different jobs, but also across firms and across sectors. So, here. so that movement of people is really very important to get these, uh, these spillover uh, effects uh, here. Uh, and also important to note is that this will typically take a much longer time before you see actually all these private returns. So the returns on investment for investment really take a much longer time window uh, than, than other capital investments. And then the final other important very specific point of innovation is, yes, it's a creative power, but it's, great, it's also a destructive power. It, it uh, destructs all technologies, products, and skills. And particularly the creative destruction power comes from the more radical innovations and they often come from new firms which are challenging uh, the incumbents here. So we also need to identify the type of frontier firms uh, here and making distinction between new versus uh, incumbent firms uh, here. So what do we now know about uh, measurements of innovation directly? Do we see the same kind of, of downturn taking all these effects into account? So unfortunately, we don't have that good measures about the effects of innovation and the social rates of return. The fusion is very hard to measure. Um, but we do have in, uh, better data on investment for uh, innovation. And of course, that's an input variable, so it doesn't reflect the effects. But it's nevertheless a very good indicator because input variables already reflect the capacities of, of firms uh, to invest uh, in, in innovation, not just only the creation of new ideas, but also the, do the adoption. Um, and it's also a reflection of do they have the right incentives uh, to invest. So capacities and incentives should be reflected in these uh, input variables as well. So if you take a look at innovation expenditures, and that's really the most broader uh, definition of, of um, uh, investments, because that uh, includes investment not just for creating own ideas, but also for adopting and adapting uh, other uh, innovations. Um, what we know, we, we have... Um, community innovation survey evidence, which is run across uh, countries uh, here um, uh, and across time. Uh, unfortunately, it's usually, it's a repeated cross-section. It's not a panel, and that's why it's sometimes very hard to really get good time trends on that. But for Germany, uh, it is really a panel that can be traced. Um, and there we can look at really both the extensive and the intensive margin. So do we see more or less companies over time uh, engaged in these innovation expenditures? And what we see is, is actually very interesting is that uh, overall the number of firms that are active in innovation uh, investments has actually decreased uh, over time. And that's actually a trend that holds particularly for SMEs that are less likely to adopt new technologies uh, here. So we see actually a drop in extensive margin of innovation active firms here, uh, and also a drop in the intensive margin as well. Nevertheless, overall, 
the expenditures for, for R&D, and particularly so for the creative part here, is increasing in Germany, even the share of GDP here. Um, but that comes mostly from the large companies that are increasingly investing in R&D. So overall, we see a larger inequality in the innovation landscape here. So a number of, of smaller firms particularly dropping out and a more concentration in uh, the, the leading firms uh, in Germany. So that's why we also look at uh, corporate R&D. So that's the R&D investment for creation of, of new, new uh, ideas. Um, by the way, most of these expenditures actually don't go to infrastructure, but go to R&D personnel here. So it's, it's more than three quarters of that is investing in people rather than uh, in equipment uh, here. These aggregate um, R&D numbers is something we, we uh, con constantly trace with the OECD BERT numbers. Uh, and they show actually there is no drop in, in, in BERT here. It's pretty... Uh, it goes slightly up. And in Europe, it's pretty stable with a slight increase uh, here. Of course, the, the China is a stellar growth performance um, on, on this dimension here. But at least the good news is that in Europe, uh, we're not going down on these uh, corporate uh, investments uh, here. But if we take a look at the firms that are uh, behind these corporate R&D um, investment trends here, um, and we look at uh, the, uh, the scoreboard uh, firms which are traced by uh, the European Commission on a, on a, uh, um, since, since a couple of years uh, here, uh, but these are only the largest R&D firms, the 2,500 largest firms, uh, traced over time. Uh, we see that overall that total investment of these firms also has continued to go up. So we don't see the same kind of down, uh, downward trend there again. But, um, and that's recent work we've been doing at Bruegel on these scoreboard data, we do see that there is a difference in terms of concentration that's taking place within that, uh, that world of large R&D spenders uh, here. So these R&D spenders are highly concentrated in a few firms. Uh, so that uh, corresponds to also with, with uh, David's uh, analysis here. It's even more concentrated than their sales and employment uh, here. So for instance, the top 10% of these 2,500 firms, so the 250 largest ones, they, uh, they account for three quarters of all the R&D expenditures uh, here. And the top 1%, the, so the, the top 25, almost one third. So it's very highly concentrated in, in few uh, firms. If you look at the trends over time in this concentration, we did see a downward trend in concentration of this R&D expenditure. So the concentration went down. But this downward trend has stopped more recently and is now starting to increase again, and particularly the share of the top one uh, here. So it becomes increasingly more concentrated on fewer firms uh, here. Uh, that concentration is particularly high in uh, what we call innovation-based growth sectors. So these are the higher tech, higher R&D growth sectors where there are more new R&D leading firms. More, so these are the sectors where there's really much more dynamics uh, going on. That's typically the pharma biotech uh, nexus and then the ICT nexus, both hardware and software. Um, in pharma and biotech, we see it's very highly concentrated uh, in terms of R&D expenditures, uh, but at the same time, we also see it's a very stable set of top firms uh, here. Despite the biotech revolution here, classic pharma is, is still very much dominant in that sector uh, here, um, and they have really identified this, this biotech challenge by taking over a lot of these small biotech firms here, but it's still the same kind of leading firms that are dominating this sector. If we look at ICT, there we actually see it's also very highly concentrated, but we see um, there we see this upward trend in concentration of R&D, and that holds particularly in the US uh, ICT. Actually, basically, Europe is not present in, in ICT in terms of the landscape uh, here. So we see that in ICT in the US, there is recently an increase in this concentration of, of R&D, not in employment, only in R&D expenditures uh, here. The question is, should we worry about this, uh, this higher concentration of corporate R&D in fewer firms? That all depends. So it could be that, indeed, these leading firms are simply the more efficient ones uh, here in terms of R&D. They're exploiting better R&D economies of scale and scope. Uh, and, and in that respect, then the increase in concentration is a higher efficiency of the R&D uh, landscape. Um, this could hold particularly in pharma and biotech, because there are, indeed, very large economies of scale and scope in R&D. 
Um, however, in, in ICT, what we see is that this increase in concentration comes also with a higher turbulence in leadership uh, here. There are also much more new leaders uh, within this landscape here, so it's a concentration, but with a higher turbulence. Um, and so you could argue that these new leaders bring in the more newer I IDs uh, here. Um, so just to give you some, some illustration of these numbers here, but I have to be very... <laughs> so in, IC, in, in Pharma, 93% uh, of the R&D expenditures by the top 10 in 2015 came from firms that were already top 10 in 2005 uh, here. So you see how much it's mm. concentrated. In ICT, that's only, but only 70%. So it's still highly concentrated, but it's less. Uh, and at least we have two new firms uh, that belong to this top five, that's Huawei and Facebook here. So there is a bit more turbulence uh, going on here. Um, I'd just like to make the point that it's, we, we really need to look beyond the, the sheer size of investments in, in R&D here. We also really need to look at who is making these investments here, uh, the distribution of that investment into uh, leading firms uh, here and the diffusion aspect uh, here. Uh, but overall, uh, I think, although the total um, investments is not such an, an, an issue here, it's that increase in concentration that we need to, to be more careful about mm -hmm. understanding the process better. Thanks. The, the, thank you very much, Renil. The discussion will be on policy, of course, and we will concentrate on that. And uh, Hall, you will tell us probably that science fiction is today already. And, uh, is that yesterday. 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 <laughs> yesterday, even. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, when I thought about what I'd talk about today, I asked Peter for some guidance. He sent me some questions, and they were such good questions, I'm going to structure my uh, talk around those questions. Uh, first one was, were innovations of tomorrow be driven by new firms or established incumbents? So that's very tempting to give an economist answer. Well, on the one hand, on the other hand, but actually both is the answer. And let me, let me, explain, uh, let me explain that. So uh, here in Europe, we hear a lot about GAFAM. Now, Americans never see this acronym. It stands for Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, these big American uh, incumbents in the uh, IT area. But far from being some kind of sleepy cartel with highly concentrated industries, what we've heard about earlier, they actually compete very intensely among themselves, very intensely. They compete in operating systems, office productivity applications, cloud computing, devices, advertising services, and many others. If you sit down for a few minutes, you can create a table that shows you this, uh, this effect. And it's because of that competition that the prices are low often free, and innovation is very rapid. So competition has delivered as promised, lots of innovation, low prices, uh, lots of uh, activity. But more importantly, it's not just those incumbents that are benefiting from this environment, but even the uh, startups, the new firms. Because now they can go buy cloud computing and networking from Amazon, Google, Microsoft. They use open source tools like Python, TensorFlow, Hadoop, and that's virtually eliminated the fixed cost of entering a business. I like to call this the return of constant returns because you can go out and purchase the business services on an as-necessary basis. As you grow, you can add more in a seamless way, and this has made a huge difference in the startup world. Susan Woodward at Sand Hill Econometrics says that since 2010, there have been 4,000 new companies founded in Europe, raised over $27 billion, and a large part of this is due to the fact that the business services and the technological services necessary to enter have changed dramatically. When Google started, when Microsoft started, you had to build your own data centers, you had to create your own software, you had to go out and build all of those fixed costs because, before you could produce anything, but now those services are, uh, are readily available. You can rent computing, networking, tools in the cloud, uh, and uh, it's easy to get started and easy to grow. So take an example, Netflix. Netflix is based on the web. It's based on serving data, but it has no data servers of its own. It has no network of its own. It just uses Amazon Web, Amazon web Services to provide that. Spotify, Evermore, Airbnb, Costco, Snapchat, they all run in the Google Cloud, right? They're not providing their own infrastructure. They can go out and buy the infrastructure because you have this very competitive uh, supply from the firms I alluded to a minute ago. And it's not just on the computing side. You can hire people through LinkedIn. 
You can find customers using Salesforce. You can do your accounting using QuickBooks. You outsource user support using Zendesk, Zendesk, on and on and on. If you want these services, you can go find them, and you can go uh, implement them on an as-needed uh, basis. There are literally hundreds of these specialized support services that can be purchased at whatever scale is necessary. So Adam Smith once said, the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market, famous quote. But nowadays, we'd say the division of business services is limited by the extent of the market. But the market is a global market. So these business services can be provided in a very, very fine degree of granularity and specialization. Second question. Second question was, what are the latest technologies not being adopted by sufficiently large share firms, and what can be done about it? Well, I think the answer there is very easy. It's machine learning, predictive analytics, all of these uh, stuff we've been uh, hearing about in the news. There's a computer in the middle of every economic transaction now. And because that computer is in the middle of the transactions, you can capture data from the transaction. You can store that data, manipulate it, analyze it, and so on. Everybody has a data warehouse, every uh, major firm. The software is readily right available. As I mentioned earlier, cloud computing provides the platform for the analytics. What's left over? The expertise, what you were talking about. The expertise is the problem. Uh, but even there, not for long, because the universities have responded very quickly to start offering programs in data science and analytics. Not a week goes by that I don't get an email that says, we're putting together a new program in data science. Uh, what should the curriculum be? Can you come talk to us? Can you help us? And so on. Just in the last few months, it was at MIT, at Stanford, at Berkeley. Michigan, all of these places are uh, getting into this area and turning out the students. In fact, the choke point now, the difficult area, is actually uh, on the firm's hiring. Because if you don't have the expertise internal to the firm, it's very hard to understand who to hire, what skills you need, what are the differences, and so on. What are the differences? A, st a statistician? an econometrician, a data scientist, a machine learning special, specialist, and so on. Uh, without that internal expertise, it's, it's hard to, uh, to uh, build up. But of course, you bring in consultants, you bring in outside experts, you develop that in-house expertise, and then you can utilize uh, that technology. And finally, the last question. What's the most important factors that ensure cross-fertilization between fundamental university research, what we've been talking about uh, here, industry research and development, and then business uh, investment. So I want to talk specifically about Google because I know what Google's doing, but uh, this is a widespread uh, phenomenon. Uh, we provide a lot of open source software. For example, recently we've released this uh, system called TensorFlow. TensorFlow is a system for doing machine learning at scale, at huge scale. Um, the software makes it completely transparent. If you want to run your uh, analysis on a single CPU, on a GPU, graphical processing units, on TPU, the tensor processing units, you want to run your analysis on a thousand machines at once, that's just a simple instruction to the, uh, to the system. We also provide the training data because to do this kind of deep learning, you need to have data that's trained so we donated 9 million labeled images with 6,000 labels to the Open Image Project. So if you want to do something in image recognition, you can go out and get these 9 million. Actually, there already was 9 million, so nearly 20 million labeled, labeled images to uh, train your system on. We also provided 8 million YouTube videos. That's 500,000 hours worth of video along with the video labels from a diverse set of 4,800 different labels. <clears throat> For those of you not uh, intimately connected with the machine learning image processing, image processing by machines now beats humans. So you can get a better set of, once you've trained it on this label data, the, the computers beat humans. Uh, but humans are still way ahead in understanding YouTube videos. Because all those cats, you know. No, what happens is uh, it's very hard to, to, to learn actions. 
you see people, are they dancing? Are they fighting? Are they doing kung fu? Are they exercising? Computers are having a quite a hard time with this, so now the uh, YouTube videos are out there to help make uh, progress in this area. We've also donated uh, 1,000 cloud uh, tensor processing units to universities. Each one offers 180 teraflops of floating point performance, 64 gigabytes of memory, and they're available to all the universities. So why do we do this? Is this great altruism on our part? Well, there's a little bit of altruism there, I have to say, a little bit. But on the other hand, we want those students to know how to use those systems. We want them to know how to use TensorFlow. We want them to know how to deal with these labeled images. We want that to be a skill that they come to the job with. And in fact, we hire thousands of interns a year for exactly the same reason, because the big competition now is competition for talent. With ta talent. Talent. Yeah, competition for talent. Interesting. That's the, yeah, yeah. That's the single most uh, significant yeah. definition of competition. And of course, from the viewpoints of the job applicants who are looking for jobs, what are they considering? They're saying, I want to go where they can learn the most. I want to go to mm -hmm. the place where I can develop my skills, make myself highly marketable, and uh, succeed in my chosen mm -hmm. line of work. Mm -hmm. So that's what's happening now. It's a very vibrant time. Uh, I think we'll see more of that in the future. Mm. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, I think it's interesting because to prepare this session, I, I, I Googled, actually, I Googled now to see the difference between skill and talent, you know, ah. which you came exactly. And, uh, and, uh, and then I asked myself about what is a low skilled job? I mean, certainly look at the, the next 20 years. And I thought it basically uh, what cannot be replicated. You know, mm -hmm. it's a lot of emotional interactions, which are, is, is one of the points you made, you know, when described, you know, the development of technology and, and, uh, and robots, actually. Maybe in the end they will be able to do that. But, uh, and then I thought about many uh, what we call low-skill jobs are not very well paid, in spite of the fact that very often they have this uh, comparative advantage compared to machines uh, and learning machines yeah. in the future. Uh, and then you think about the low-skilled jobs like nurseries, you know, and these things, which are really make a difference in many jobs now. And they may be asking myself the relative price how it's going to evolve in the future, uh, because now it's usually low-paid jobs, even for those who have sort of talent of dealing with interacting with other people in general. So I mean, that's uh, because you you, ha you you provide a sort of very positive picture of, of the environment. Uh, now, when you aggregate that at a societal level, I mean, there you were, you were basically silent there. Uh, well, I'll say a word you? on it. If, uh, if I have another Well, yes, minutes. because now, now we, enter, we enter the reaction of the panel phase, which takes you right. a couple of minutes. Right. So that's one I mean, just to kick off, and then uh, you react to each other, and then I open the floor. But very quickly, just uh, I give my, my sense. Okay. Now. So well, when the job demands this level of skill and the available workers have this level of skill, there's two ways to solve that. Mm -hmm. You can bring the worker up to the necessary point, or you can lower the job to the skills that are appropriate for the worker. So it used to be, to be a cashier, you had to know how to make change. Irrelevant. It used to be, to be a taxi driver, you had to know how to get around a city. Mm -hmm. Now, irrelevant. Mm -hmm. It used to be, to be a physicist, you had to know 100 different integrals. Now, no longer necessary. We have symbolic integration systems that can calculate those integrals. So in many, many cases, the skills that were prerequisites for a job at one point have now become provided yeah. to the user via the information technology on an as-needed that's basis. Why, that's why the distinction yeah. skills and talent, actually. Yep. Yep. Do you want to react? I mean, uh, well, you know, it's more policy, huh? But it's because it's, well, it's I'm, rosy, I'm, I'm, I'm rosy tickled by, by what by what Hal just said yeah. because yeah. I think there's this, this has been around for, for for quite a while. This didn't start with digitalization, Not new. and in fact, I think there's a paper in, in, in written in the 1970s in which one economic historian basically said that if things are going the way they're going, in the asymptote, we will have machines designed by geniuses to be operated by idiots. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think it's going to be no. quite that bad, but that is precisely the kind of thing mm -hmm. that you were talking about. I want to make, if I may, my one response mm -hmm. to Mariana's talk, which I, yeah, yeah. I love the, entrep the entrepreneurial state, and I think she's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. But I think behind that is actually that we see technological change occurring at very rapid rate. When there is something called a focusing device. When, mm -hmm. she, when, she, mm -hmm. when society puts in front of it a problem that it feels it needs to solve, mm -hmm. okay? And so what the government does, basically, it aggregates 
society's preferences and it channels it to a region. So this has been always been true. In the, in the 18th century, mm. British society had a number of problems that it knew that it knew it had to solve. Okay, one of them is how to pump water out of mines. Mm. Another is how to prevent smallpox, and the third one is how to me measure longitude at sea. In 1800, all of those three were solved. Mm -hmm. We have exactly the same problem in the, 19, in, in the late 19th century. We had to learn how to uh, fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. People worked on it, they solved it. They had to make cheap steel, they solved it. What is the situation today? We have mm -hmm. a very well, clear cut, defined issue that we have to solve. It's called right. climate change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is where a lot of effort, and, and I believe we'll tackle it. I don't know how exactly, but we will tackle it. And by the way, mm -hmm. climate change is mm -hmm. evil twin, mm -hmm. is ocean acidification. Oh, yeah. Good luck solving that one. So, very good point. And this whole focusing device is what I basically meant by the mission orientedness mm -hmm. and why we need that to focus. You know, broadly defined directions and then allowing this bottom-up experimentation. There was 500 homework problems that got us to the moon, again, cross-sectoral. However, if you look at what's happening currently in Europe, there's huge differences in how the climate change uh, problem is being tackled. In some countries, I would argue in the UK, very patchily, very unstably. You know, feed and tariff here, then we take it out. A bit of funding here, then we change the name of the agency, then we cut the agency, then we restart new policy. Versus Germany, which is not perfect, the energy event policy is not perfect, but what's very interesting about that policy, it's very mission oriented. It's required every sector in Germany to transform itself. So instead of having a sectoral based policy, say just renewable energy or some other sector, the, the energy event policy has created a challenge, a mission, and has rewarded those companies in those sectors that have been willing to respond. So steel, in some, sec in some countries, remains quite boring and has to be bought up by the Indians, Tata Steel having to buy up the UK steel industry. In Germany and in Belgium, steel has massively lowered its material content through repurpose, reuse, and recycle, not just because they woke up one day and wanted to do it, but it was very much, again, challenged to do it that way. But can, can I just ask a really quick question to Hal yeah, about yeah, Google? Yeah. So quick. Google, the, the, you know, what did it get from government? It got its algorithm, yeah. right, yeah. publicly financed by the NSF. It got GPS, yeah. you know, which, mm -hmm. what would Google Maps yeah. be without it? My question to Hal is, should, and I'm really saying it sort of, you know, openly, should government sometimes, not for the basic R&D, that's obvious, retain a share in these investments? You know, Tesla got 465 million guaranteed loan success, Solyndra 500 million, taxpayers asked mm -hmm. to pick up the loss, it doesn't necessarily get a share of the success. Mm -hmm. Should we be thinking about sharing not mm -hmm. just risks, mm -hmm. also rewards, and what would that mean for Google in terms of the benefits well, and the profits that you currently have? Well, just one, one slight correction. Actually, Stanford owns uh, the original mm -hmm. patent on mm -hmm. uh, page rank. Yeah. I like to say Stanford, it's like a university, but with money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> And part of the reason it has all that money is because they've really funded scientific research and they've contributed dramatically to the economy, not just of Silicon Valley, but of the entire world. So that's the system we have. Uh, I like to see universities get money from intellectual property. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe there should be some sharing arrangement with mm -hmm. the federal government. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It was a good polling question, but we don't have that in our list. <laughs> we will have uh, one of the polling questions just after Ranil. Uh, yep. So that will be question two in, in, in our list. Just wait, wait until uh, Ranil is finished. <laughs> just wait a minute. Yeah, I, I'd like no, to go back to wait. this issue of talent uh, and skills because I think that's really very crucial for innovation. It's yeah. really, is uh, everything draws around having these talented people uh, being able to create and diffuse new ideas here. Uh, but of course, the talent needs to be nurtured, needs to be trained, and who has the incentives to train the talent uh, here? So uh, certainly because this training will actually be not just only firm-specific, application-specific, but should be a general type of training here. Um, so all the examples that you gave of universities, do they have the incentives to train? We're all from the, from the US. In Europe, I still think we, we, we missing a bit that single market for, for education and for training here, which reduces the incentives for universities to, uh, to train very specific skills here. Um, and also one other question I still have on, on, on the training here is if training happens in corporate uh, mm. companies here, to which extent is that specific? Uh, and to which extent do these companies 
still try to, to, to appropriate the rents from that investment uh, here, and that may actually uh, reduce the, the social returns from the training and, and the mobility of the people to move outside yeah. here. So that's definitely so, also... So we have now the, uh, the question, the polling question we, we are asking. Not so yet. the question is, do you It's not yet in the iPad? No, no, it is. You know how to handle the iPad? I hope so. <laughs> do you think that the productivity gains derive from the ICT revolution? Alternatives A, have slowed down given that they have been largely ripped by now. No, B, no. will accelerate given that the full potential of the ICT revolution has not emerged yet. C, are neither slowing down nor accelerating. We'll see how she takes Yeah, this. okay. Uh, so, uh, of course, you no. can guess my answer, I think. That's not uh, for you. That's for the audience. Oh, it's Don't for the audience. Them. Okay. So oh, the, <laughs> they're taking up our time? No, no. I, I hope. Shall I? I, I, need, I need a pen, actually, an old technology. Ah, oh, yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, we have 10 more seconds. You don't have another one. No, it's okay. One. I, need a, I need a pen. So you're going to? I need a pen. So your answer Take a vote. Old technology. Here. <laughs> Can we answer? No, no, you don't answer. No, the audience from is supposed to answer. From the audience, yes. Yeah. So I will... Should finished? we have a referendum? You finished? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, ah, seven to ah. will accelerate given that potential has, has not emerged yet. Good. It's not emerged yet. <laughs> yeah. I guess. Uh, we'll answer that? Well, no, but what would what, what you have said? I mean... Oh, 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 I see 72% yeah, yeah, agree with me. That's good. Agree, agree uh, with you, yes. <laughs> no. That's, that's, more, no, that's more than no, Trump. No, no. No, I pick up questions. Three, four questions, and then uh, uh, the first round of questions. questions the audience. Yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you give your name, affiliation, as, as usually. Yes. Uh, I know you from um, Amsterdam. Yeah. Eric Bartelsman, uh, director of the Tinbergen Institute in Amsterdam. Um, one of the currents that I saw through all of the three is the incentives for, for doing the uh, doing innovation, R&D, et cetera, for academics, its reputation. I'm just wondering, though, whether the, it was mentioned a little bit, but all your views on the winner take all. Do you think that's actually going to start reducing the uh, desire of people in Silicon Valley to work day and night and end up at their 30th birthday going back to their mother's couch and only one mm -hmm. person gets 50 billion? Is that going to uh, undermine the incentives to have the winner take all that's get so strong as it is? Hard. And what I to do about it? I pick up three questions first, huh? uh, so we take note of this one. Uh, second, yeah. and then I have a Piro TV. Yeah. Uh, Richard Portis, London Business School and CPR. And we have um, uh, the first session, sort of. I, I want to focus on policy, policy conclusions. First session, policy conclusion was uh, to focus on the quality of jobs. And in a sense, my question relates to the exchange between Peter and uh, Hal right at the end uh, a minute ago. Um, how do you raise the quality of the job uh, mm. in uh, picking fruit, uh, in care of old people, uh, in a whole range of the yeah. services which are it's essentially good. which are low-paid yeah. services for which we in the UK cannot attract young people mm. to do these jobs? Okay. Mm -hmm. We therefore import them, right? But that's what's supposed to stop. What happens after that is not clear. Nurses in the healthcare system, um, it's, you know, it's going to be very difficult. Mm -hmm. Innovation-led growth, how does that help raise the quality of jobs for mm -hmm. these often poorly tra trained young people who mm -hmm. don't want to move, many of them. They don't want to leave their communities where they've grown up, right? And that's a problem we see in the UK, in many communities, Brexit land, and a problem, of course, that you see in the US, Trump land. Uh, and I'm interested whether the panel thinks somehow innovation-led growth is going to pull these people mm. up. It's a relative price which may adjust, you know, those with involving emotional interactions versus the others which not. Uh, it's maybe too early, uh, but at some point we're going to see that probably, what you say. But that will be for later. Um, yes, Phil? For LT there. My question is actually uh, for Peter Pratt and uh, embracing power we discussed also in the last uh, round. So 
we've seen that there is a, a shift of investment towards intangible uh, and generally a certain type of technology or skill, uh, sort of human capital is the beneficiary. And the net result seems to be a declining corporate demand for external finance. Credit markets are simply not the way in which the new forms of investment are financed. Uh, it, uh, and that means that there is also truly a smaller role to play for policy intervention in credit markets. So a bit provocatively, but what is then the residual role for monetary policy in promoting investment in this context? Mm -hmm. I'll ask my colleagues on this. <laughs> um, maybe, uh, well, let me take a fourth uh, question and then, then we, we close the first round. Thanks. Yeah? I have a quick question. Sergey Guriev, Chief Economist of EBRD. My question is for Mariana. I think uh, your idea of government taking a stake in a success, uh, to what extent do you think that's already been done through profit tax? Government mm -hmm. is a shareholder in every company because it has a share mm -hmm. in every company's profit. And in that sense, when Google makes another billion in corporate profits, government does take a gap. Mm -hmm. To what extent do you think your mm -hmm. idea has already been addressed? Your, your mm -hmm. idea has been implemented. You want to take this one now? Just can sure. and then so there's different ways that the government could um, take a share. It used to be, in fact, tax. I mean, do people just yell out a number? What was the top marginal taxation rate when NASA and DARPA were founded? And the president at the time was a Republican, <laughs> Eisenhower. What was it? 90. Over 90, right? So obviously what's happened to tax, including also different types of tax loopholes that if we wanted to, we could fix, whatever. You know, that has changed massively. We also, by the way, when we go to war, we don't worry about tax, we go to war, we create money through different means, right? But let's ignore those two possibilities of, you know, create money to do innovation like we do with war or, um, you know, raise top marginal taxation rate back to what it was. There's different ways. One is, I think, downstream, downstream. This is different from sort of the upstream stuff where you really can assume that there will just be spillovers, you know, knowledge spillovers, et cetera. Um, downstream, when you're giving particular companies 500 million and a guaranteed loan, Elon Musk, one man, Five billion from the U.S. government for his three companies, right? Uh, SpaceX, um, Solar City, mm. and Tesla. So these downstream investments to particular individuals and particular companies, I really think it's completely naive not to think about, you know, sharing the risks and rewards. As, by the way, Yasma does through royalties, as Citra used to do through equity, as any state investment bank through its investment fund would do. NASA is not allowed to make a penny on any of its investments. It can only get money through the Budget Appropriations Committee. That would be fine if NASA was just doing basic research, but when it allows Novartis to work for free in the International Space Station, <laughs> I think you know, that's a problem. Or the space tourism, which costs 30 million, whatever it is, to go up there, Justin Bieber goes up, unfortunately comes back down. You know, that money, not a penny, goes to NASA. Why? You know, we can rethink these. And by the way, we used to also rethink it in terms of admitting that things like patents were a deal between government and the company. Now, what we've been allowing to be patented hurts that deal to the public return. We're increasingly patenting upstream, so the tools for research are being patented. So we're kind of going back to the world of secrecy. That's a bad deal. It's not about should we or should we not have patents, but the public return falls if then the diffusion of that innovation once the patent's up has been hurt, and of course it'll be hurt from that. Last example, the Beidol Act, which allowed publicly financed research to be patented from 1980 onwards, in the act, you know, it's, it's actually there in the act, it says, well, we better make sure the taxpayer doesn't pay twice, 32 billion a year is what the taxpayer in the US pays for the National Institutes of Health, 75% of new molecular entities with priority rating come from that kind of finance. Um, and the uh, act says we better make sure you, know, you don't pay twice, so let's allow the prices of those drugs that have been massively publicly financed to be capped, so, sort of marching rights. The US government has never exercised its right. So this is also a power play. When the narrative is so strongly skewed you know, that somehow innovation all occurs in companies and at best what government's doing is leveling the playing field, fixing market failures, that also confidence for government to say, okay, well, yeah, of course we should cap the prices of drugs that we help to finance, not because we're just regulating the process, but we co-created that system itself. That, you know, I think is, is, is a power issue and it's been fed by ideology. Um, and so it's not just about equity stakes, even though I do think, you know, sorry, yeah. just quick, really quickly, no, with Tesla, Obama did the opposite. He said, if you don't pay back the loan, 465 million, 
uh, we get three million shares in your company. And it's like, why would you want three million shares in a company that doesn't pay back its loan? Probably because it's not very good. Had he done the opposite, three million shares in 2013 when the loan was paid back, the price per share had gone from nine to 90. That would have more than paid back the Solyndra loss, which you can bet would have made the taxpayer, and this is about the consensus building and not getting taxpayers pissed off that you know, they're always just picking up the bill, whether it's of the banks or of the Solyndras, that would have helped. But somehow this isn't you know, a question that we're asking. Mm -hmm. Jordan, do you want to? I actually was reflecting yeah, on what yeah, Mariana yeah, was yeah, saying. Yeah. It is, you know, what she's saying is absolutely true. On the other hand, it's worth keeping in mind that you know, there's a famous paper by Nordhaus who actually calculated that when firms innovate, 97% of the, of the social surplus filters down to consumers. And so eventually the taxpayer is also the consumer. Right, right. So I'm not losing all that much sleep over this. I do want to answer Eric Bartelsmann, a really brilliant question about, about is there a winner-take-all uh, system uh, in some sense, destructive for the incentives. You know, I, I thought about this a very long time because it, it, it is an important issue. And here's something, the way I wanted you to think about this. People buy tickets in lotteries. And ex ante, you know, they, you know they, we all know the, expe the expected value is, is zero, is negative, but they still buy these tickets, the, the tickets in lotteries. Now, actually innovating or any kind of entrepreneurial activity is like buying a ticket in a lottery, and people buy tickets in a lottery. But there's a difference between a ticket in a lottery and engaging in innovation and entrepreneurial activity. And that's actually pointed out uh, by Adam Smith in a, in a very lovely passage, you know, which he actually said, people are overly optimistic about their own capabilities. And so we have the odd phenomenon, which is that the unconditional probability <laughs> is obviously had to have to add up to one, but the, but, but the conditional probability a larger than one because everybody thinks she's smarter than the average, right? This is like Lake Wobegun. We're all above average. And, and of course, that is what that over optimistic illusionary thing is actually what's driving innovation. And so, yes, uh, in the end, there will be a lot of disappointed people who will not win the Nobel Prize and whose companies do not get to be the Googles and the Apples of the mm. of, of future. And there's probably some negative social surplus associated with it. But that is way, way, way smaller than the total social uh, surplus that accrues to society from the fact that most of us are overly optimistic, which is a really good okay, thing. Please. and then Hall. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I want to say a word or two <laughs> about the, oh, I'm sorry, did I? You settle, you settle. Okay, go ahead. It's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Go on, go on. Yeah. So I... Uh, <laughs> oh, no, no, you want to you take it? <laughs> I want to say uh, one, one word that hasn't been mentioned this morning and should have been, and that's demography. demography. Because if we look at the U.S. right now, the labor force is growing at half the rate of the population. Next decade, the 2020s, you're going to see the lowest labor force growth mm. ever in uh, post-war data. If you look at Japan, China, Germany, Korea, Italy, they all have a terrible demographic problem uh, in terms of reduction in the labor force. And what does that mean for the wage? Well, we would think that you would see the wage rise for unskilled workers, especially because computerization can provide the, the skills on an ad needed basis mm -hmm. in, uh, in many situations. So I think all of our intuitions yeah or about this period when we've had this surplus of labor because of the baby boom on the one hand and women entering the labor force on the other, both of those have maxed out. And in the future, we're seeing the baby bust and we're seeing a uh, low participation in the workforce. All the discussions we've had uh, suggest that, that and uh, we're going to see a higher wage, larger share going towards the uh, labor bill. Good, good. I would also like to uh, come back to that question of Eric on, on the extent to which concentration might be reducing the incentives uh, to innovate. Um, and particularly the incentives for these uh, new creative ideas that come from new entrepreneurs. So you, would that be indeed reduced if we have more concentrated uh, markets? So, I, and I guess indeed the answer could be yes as well as no. Yes would mean that indeed if these incumbents would indeed form barriers to entry, making it less attractive for new players to come in. Um, but it doesn't have to be. It could also be just increasing the incentives if these entrepreneurs with these new creative ideas can then sell their ideas at the right price 
to these uh, incumbents, which would be more cost uh, efficient to use these new ideas here. So it all depends on the extent to which we would have a well-functioning market for technology here, um, and definitely also requires that we have uh, both competition policy and regulatory authorities here to make sure that innovation is high on their radar screen too, to make sure that you have a fluid market there as well, so that it could be positive. Uh, Pick up the concentration. Yeah, go on. concentration. Uh, just yeah. Another view of this concentration problem is, you know, there's different reasons why a market might be concentrated, and sometimes it's also government permitted. So when AT and T was a monopoly, very concentrated market, it led to innovation. Also, coming back to my previous point, government was a bit more confident at the time. They forced AT and T to create Bell Labs. That was part of the condition to retain your monopoly status. You had to reinvest those profits. And this is very interesting in a context today where we have record level hoarding of cash in both the US and in Europe and record levels of financialization. Google, I think, is very interesting because it does actually reinvest its profits in big areas, sort of as Bell Labs did in terms of energy, and no one asked them to. But I think the other side of that is also this whole corporate governance issue that when you have large companies, what they're again doing with their profits also then affects the small companies that they buy up. So Cisco has undergone massive change in terms of its corporate governance and its level of financialization. And speaking to companies that have been bought up by Cisco, the experience of being bought up in its history when it was reinvesting the profits back into R&D and human capital is very different from its experience today. Similar with Pfizer, extremely financialized company, it didn't used to be that way. When it buys up a small biotech company, it's a bit, you know, the, the, the ability of that unit to continue to be innovating and to think differently and to continue to be disruptive is very different if you're in a monster that is ultra financialized versus one that's quite functional in terms of what it's doing with its profits. So corporate governance issues, I think, are key more than just a static view of how concentrated a sector is and how big a company is. Let me ask the second polling question in all this is number one. So, question number one is, a lot of new technologies are being That's invented. Yes. Electric and self-driving cars, <laughs> clean energy, new materials. What should be the role of the government? The options are, A, the government should only provide the legal frameworks. B, the government should actively support innovation with subsidies. C, the government should provide, both provide legal frameworks and subsidies. <laughs> D, the government should not intervene. So you have <laughs> um, about a minute. Question. Cast your vote, please. <laughs> Why subsidies? No, yeah, no. It's, it's, it's very no, no, interesting. Go on, go on. Why, Why subsidies? subsidies? <laughs> so Why subsidies? The reason I, I, Italy is so problematic yeah. is the way the state intervenes is but through subsidies. Don't influence. Yeah. Them. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I've been talking about investing, co-investing. So please, I mean, let's, let's see what, what you're... But you're missing a choice. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I agree mm -hmm. with you. Co-invest. Right. None of the above. <laughs> no, these are the, the results. And D is subsumed in A. This is not well phrased. It's not yeah. well phrased. Can we rephrase? <laughs> <Yeah>. Yes, <laughs> for the next one. Well, yes, both, both, 54. And the first one is very, it's very high. Only the legal frameworks. And, uh, so let me pick up a number of, of questions, a second round of questions. And, uh, Looking around. Oh, yes, uh, Sylvester, yeah. Uh, I, have, uh, Sylvester, I, have you told me. I have one question which is relating to the fine Google received uh, this today, uh, 2.8 billion, with reserves of 86. Don't you think that one of the reasons why all these firms get these enormous fines have to do with the tax arbitrage these firms do? Mm -hmm. uh, with the rents, you know, uh, relatively they are maybe undertaxed. And then, you know, from a normative point of view, maybe society on a European, on a global level thinks, well, hmm, we have to do something about that. And of course, they find, of course, the, the all kinds of mm -hmm. limitations in competition, monopolies, etc. But maybe one of the things behind that is the general feeling from a normative point of view that these firms are having enormous rents and don't pay relative uh, appropriate taxes. Mm -hmm. 
Other questions? Uh, well, yes. I mean, I can, I can always. No, there's another question oh, there. Yes, can identify yourself, please? <laughs> I know. I know who is. Robert Gordon from Northwestern. Uh, I wanted to link together Joel's emphasis on the interaction between science and technology and Hal's examples of cloud computing as a new tool which has allowed many firms to essentially scale up with variable costs instead of massive fixed costs of developing their own IT departments. One would have thought there would have been massive unemployment of people who used to work in the IT firm, IT departments of Netflix and Snapchat and all the other firms that you uh, gave examples of. Um, and we don't see that. Uh, we don't see an effect on productivity of the cloud computing technological revolution analogous to the big improvement in productivity growth that we saw in the 1990s as a result of the invention of the personal computer personal software, and the internet. Uh, I wonder if you could uh, compare those two types of IT revolutions, that one of the 90s which showed up in productivity, and this one that's currently going on that does not seem to be showing up in productivity. Mm -hmm. And just one hint as to where I think the answer lies, and that is that there's a lot of the economy which is simply not being impacted by cloud computing and all you have to do is look at bricks and mortar retailing, construction, utilities, education, and medical care, which taken together is a substantial part of the economy and one in which we don't see a big uh, impact of these current waves of innovation. Mm -hmm. Thanks, thanks. Um, if not, you answer on this first? And, uh, oh, hi. Yeah, yeah. I've had this conversation. It's not new. It's not. I new. have had this uh, conversation before, but, uh, but you know, for one thing, I truly believe that we can get too much, uh, shall we, engaged in productivity fetishism of some form. I mean, productivity depends on the way we measure the numerator, that's to say, output, and a great deal of the impact that we've had that that that. ICT in, in particular, but much modern technology has had, really doesn't show up in the GDP statistics for a whole variety of reasons. Part of the reason is that they really affect uh, um, the sort of transactions cost of life, so to speak. So, for instance, if you are now able to buy a pair of shoes online rather than, you know, spend, you know, half an hour driving to a shopping center and then waiting in line and, 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 and searching for, for help, you know, that is a gain in a consumer surplus in social welfare that doesn't show up anywhere in the transactions cost. I mean, there's a whole array of, of areas in which this is, this is taking place, even in, in something like Netflix. I mean, if you calculate the real impact of Netflix, you have to keep in mind that you know, Netflix engages, because of its, it's a heavily competitive industry, it engages in something like you know, close to marginal cost pricing. Marginal cost is very low because in, digi in digital technology, marginal cost by definition are low. So that means that these prices are extremely uh, low or very often zero. GPS is, is costless, you know, Wikipedia, uh, Spotify, go on. You know, all these things that have changed our lives don't show up or show up as in, in very weird ways in our new... That, I think that really matters. But the other thing, Bob, I mean, you know, basically saying you're right, large part of the economy have not been fully affected by the ICT, which is a reason to be optimistic, because it means that there's still a great deal of unexploited opportunities that will be exploited when people write better software and the, so and, and the use of software gets more diffused. So I actually see this as a very optimistic uh, uh, point. But your first point is uh, you are telling us that we are richer than what the statistics We are not only that we are richer, but we are better off better from the point of view than of what consum of consumers. The national purpose. accounts or these I, I, The national accounts, I mean, they've always been understating what's yeah. really going on. But I think the rate of understatement is getting worse as the digital sector increases because of, 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 of the nature of the technology. I think that, I that seems sort of obvious. Yeah. I'd like to come back on this question. It was addressed several times on the incentives of some of these uh, low-skilled service sectors, uh, like education and health, which are 
certainly in your public sectors uh, here. So do they have a right or enough incentives to adopt the latest technologies, often digital technologies? So why is it still such an issue to get e-health and e-education really um, uh, up and running here? I think in Europe there is still a very important low-hanging fruit, which is the single market for public procurement uh, here. So we could, we could win a lot by, by um, having that public procurement market way more effective uh, here so that we could increase the adoption of new technologies at a much more efficient and uh, lower priced uh, deal for uh, the, these public service sectors here we would be way more uh, faster in adopting these new technologies. Mm -hmm. Paul? Um, yes, well, uh, to answer Bob, I think you're exactly right. The SysAdmin is a great example. There were used to be lots of them. You had, that was one of your biggest expenses with your information technology. Now that you have cloud computing, that has uh, dramatically reduced yeah. the demand in that area, but we don't see people standing on the street uh, selling apples, at least uh, not uh, skilled system administrators. Uh, the, uh, and I will say on the sectors you mentioned, uh, just as Joel said, uh, those will be, uh, will adopt the technology in, in my view. Um, on this uh, taxation question, well remember corporate tax is supposed to be in profits, which is revenue minus cost. They're the first order for a lot of these businesses. They've got global revenue, but the costs are located in the U.S. And, uh, to a large degree. Google actually pays a 21% corporate tax rate. Uh, the debate is not so much about the magnitude of the tax, but who gets it. Mm -hmm. So there's some squabbling among countries on that, uh, on that point. Mm -hmm. Nothing new there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mariana, you want to come back to one of to, to, to which to, just to, So um, Bob Gordon's question, I think, I mean, your, I think it was your work also that showed just how long it took electricity from when it came out to get fully diffused and deployed throughout the economy, and it was something like 50 years. So if you look at personal computers, first personal computers beginning in the 70s, only now we would expect the, their impact to really be affect, you know, to be fully diffused and deployed through it, throughout the economy, and even you know, really affecting how households behave, how different types of businesses work in terms of both their production and distribution. But you know, electricity, just like the mass production example I gave, also did have these directional Pushes. I gave the example of suburbanization having been absolutely essential for the ability of mass production to get fully diffused. One way that we could think about this today is could we actually, and I ask it as a question, have bold green strategies that allow IT to get fully diffused and fully deployed. So green not just in terms of renewable energy, but really allowing how we uh, work, how we produce, how we distribute using the power of IT in that sort of green direction. Richard's question on care, I think this is also an issue. Care seen widely, not just social care or hospital care or nurses, but a caring economy. There's people who've been writing about care as, as well as a direction. Um, but that would require all sorts of synergies and really seeing the system holistically and also doing something we do in the defense sector, but for some reason we haven't done in health, which is to line up the innovation system with the access, the issue of accessibility and the price system and how, you know, when the Defense Department funds, you know, through the DOD or DARPA, technological changes that are relevant to the defense industry, the prices that are then charged take that into account. So that just shows the sort of lining up holistically of that innovation model where the downstream, you know, market accessibility is seen in that context. I think there's ways to rethink health innovation systems that see the welfare state not just a, as a redistribution of wealth, but also is intimately interlinked. Um, and this also, I think, comes to some, I mean, you didn't say it, it's, it's not just about basic research and applied research, but how we purchase, government purchasing programs have been intimately linked with how we um, no, have innovations come about. Just one quick thing on tax, yeah, though. Yeah. Um, it's not just about the Irish schemes or the Dutch schemes. Within the U.S., it's scandalous what happens, right? So Apple moving one of its subsidiaries from Cupertino, California, which is where the knowledge is more or less created, to Reno, Nevada, which is more or less a third world country where they're not, you know, they don't, <laughs> sorry, someone here. <laughs> no, no, it's scandalous because they don't pay a penny of tax in Reno, Nevada. That's how they try to attract capital. Um, and three billion was lost <laughs> to the state of California through that scheme, right? So you don't have to look internationally at these really problematic. Sorry. Dutch are also yeah, guilty, yeah. says. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, can I come back to, to how uh, maybe on the, was alluded in the speech of, of Mario this, this morning about the price discovery process, you know, the, the, the price process in general, in the context of the supply shock that, that, that you were describing, you know, the fact that it's much more transparency, access, you know, to pricing of competition, you know, in the, you have a view on this? I mean, how, what is a price today, actually? Uh, price, price. Uh, f in general, you know, we as central bankers, we have this objective, ah. price stability. And how do we measure, you know, prices today, the price level and the evolution of the price level in a context of, you know, technological changes that you described? And, uh, and what is the price? The time dimension, you know, the, the segmentation, uh, the quality of products and all these things. I mean, uh, have you, I mean because you have wor been working on, on, you know, big data also and trying to, to reflect right. all the, that aspect of the, the economic system. Well, I like to say uh, GDP has a hard time with free. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, take, take a simple example, take mm -hmm. GPS systems, which you already alluded to. Uh, at one point, they were over $1,000, they were only used in trucks. They definitely improved the efficiency mm -hmm. uh, of uh, trucking and logistics systems. They become lower, a standalone device that consumers can, can use. Fantastic. Uh, as the price gets lower and lower and lower, the real GDP goes up and up and up until it hits zero. <laughs> At that point, it's out then of GDP. Yeah, yeah. And uh, now what happens is, if you take the smartphone, smartphone has reduced the sales of yeah. cameras, yeah. of GPS machines, of yeah. music then, players, of video yeah. players, of alarm clocks, on and on and on. Uh, so overall, in terms of measurement, mm. it's probably reduced GDP mm. because of the reduction in sales of all those substitute products. And, and for now, at least, there's no hedonic adjustment on smartphones. Mm. So that mm. missing link of incorporating other devices into this general purpose device, mm. it's, uh, mm. it's problematic. Yeah. No, I think that, that, that's true across the board on a whole range of, of products that are digital. Other interventions, yes? University of Chicago, so uh, the, uh, much of the theme in the panel was the interplay between the government and innovation, and much of the theme was how governments maybe can start off with innovation. But let me bring up another theme of how government in innovation interplays, maybe that's a question to Joel, but also to others, and that's the safety by which innovators can, you know, finally get the rewards for the innovation. So I've done research, for example, with Ralph Cogen and Thomas Philippen, Philipson, where we investigated um, the, the rewards to innovation in the health sector, and we have shown that the risk of expropriation afterwards mm -hmm. drives up the necessary returns that you have to have in the R&D sector and medical innovation. So the risk that Hillary Clinton would have succeeded with her healthcare reform, the discussions that we now have about you know, profits in the medical sector being taken away from entrepreneurs means that in order to want to innovate in that sector, you have to, you have, to have the rewards of a high profit there and, and the effects of that are dramatic, right? So medical innovation would have been much higher if it hadn't been for these risks of future government interventions. The, the state of the medical knowledge would be better without that innovation. What I don't know is how much that mattered overall, how much that mattered in historical perspective, how much that mattered in other areas. I would imagine it matters in other areas as well, right? I think there's a reason that Uber was you know, created in the United States, not say in Germany, because if I was an entrepreneur in Germany, you know, thinking about creating Uber, I would immediately think about the taxi associ association, you know, protesting, not allowing me to provide that services to, uh, to people, right? So it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an environment where, where you wouldn't want to innovate. Or if you, if you think about companies that are becoming very rich and then the EU imp imposes large fines on you because they're seeing, you know, huge profits being made. Um, these, these kinds of things can really throttle, throttle innovation in certain areas. So I'm, I'm wondering how much Could political stability in a political safe you environment want, matters for creating one? Who wants to take that one? You want to go first? Oh, I just have no idea what you're talking about. So expropriation? <laughs> That's and, like what? I mean, just give an example, because otherwise I'm not sure what you're talking about. Expropriate. So, so Hillary Clinton would have expropriated whose profits? Yeah, so, so Hillary Clinton, for example, or socialized. So the, the threat is that the United States introduces, let's say, European-based health system. We know that in the, in the, in the, in, for medical R&D, the key, the key profits are earned on the US market. The, uh, the, the papers by us, Mogul and so forth, I mean, there's, there's a lot of the, 
profits in some sectors are earned in the United States because that's where the profits can be earned. And then uh, other countries can then you know, use these innovations and provide cheap medicine to their people. There's often an argument that, that medical innovations that have been made should then be yeah. shipped freely to Africa. There are, there are arguments being made that expensive medication should be made available freely to all. So there's constantly talk mm. in the United States, for example, that has maybe the most profit-oriented medical system to go and uh, you know, introduce essentially Canadian or European-based system. And because of this threat, uh, the, 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 the profits that you need to earn on R&D have to be higher. And you can, you can show, you can calculate that this effect is pretty dramatic. There's a higher alpha, for example, if you invest in healthcare, healthcare shares. So there's a lot of evidence that points to this healthcare expropriation, to the expropriation risk in the healthcare industry as something that uh, you know, drives up necessary yeah. returns and that drives down the speed of R&D yeah. in, in, so, in the medical area. I don't and know, and the, I, so the question, yeah. the question yeah. to the panel is this. Yeah. Is the safety <laughs> that, that entrepreneurs can count on Excuse in collecting me. profits yeah. from the innovations, is that critical for innovations or, or uh, is that not important? Can I answer? Oh, yeah. So I think that's basically also what the patent system tries to address here, is to find a good balance between, on the one hand, making sure that you get enough incentives uh, during the patent protection uh, time uh, for recouping uh, these investments uh, here, but of course with the price of after that patent protection, to have the disclosure and the diffusion uh, here. So I think with the patent protection, if we, uh, if we carefully think about what the optimal trade-off would be in terms of giving enough incentives while at the same time also making sure you have the fusion. That's what a good patent system would actually do here. Now, what I would like to say on, on the patent system is that this trade-off between rewards and, 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 and costs here is something that's been done very general across different technologies here. So the patent duration that would solve this uh, here and, and the renewal fees is the same for all different types of technologies here. And it's very clear that that's completely different in, in, in pharma, biotech versus in, oh, in yeah. IT here. So I would actually argue that we should also with the, with the patent system, with the duration and particularly with the renewal fee, take more into account the differences between technologies to find a better balance between that uh, appropriation, that uh, incentives versus the, the cost of patenting. So yeah. I, I see what you're saying, but I would almost have put it in reverse, which is at least how I see it. And I, you know, I, I might be seeing it in a narrow way. From how I see the case of health and pharmaceutical companies, they are very attracted to being in the US, in particular parts of the US, because they benefit massively. They also talk about this from, for example, the National Institutes of Health program, which is 32 billion a year. It's quite stable. It even went up under Reagan, by the way. This is the first time in US history uh, where some of these organizations from ARPA-E to NIH are facing potentially very, very large cuts through the Trump administration. It wasn't true. This is, they have had actually uh, cross-partisan support up until now. So this is a new potential phase in US competitiveness. We'll see what happens. But then they move to Europe <laughs> due to these ridiculous tax schemes. And, and by the way, the patent box was first introduced in Europe. And the reason why the patent box makes no sense is patents are already monopolies for 20 years. You don't have to reduce the tax on monopoly profits. You have to try to incentivize the the hiring, if you want, of research laborers who actually create that patent, but also the corporate income tax, as we know, is actually much higher in the US than in some European countries. So if anything, it's sort of gaming the system, not this kind of entrepreneurial depiction that you mentioned, but gaming the system of where do I get the sort of patient public finance through things like the NHS? Where should I then move my activities to benefit from different types of tax schemes? And I think lining up, you know, having proper sort of international laws as, um, I can't remember who was talking about it, through the BEPS, was it Dietmar, um, is, is one way to deal with that. But the entrepreneurship of the US system, it's not about their DNA. It's not about sort of entrepreneurs somehow being more risk taking in the US. They have also been allowed to take those risks through these different types of policies, including, as I mentioned, VC in the US is very short term, right? They're exit driven. They want their returns to happen in three or five years through a buyout or an IPO. What happens before the VCs enter is fascinating. They're often free riding, which is fine. I don't say that negatively, but they come in about 20 years after the biotech investments, the nanotech investments, the internet investments, today the green investments. They come in and perhaps 
One of the problems is also that their share, this 20%, maybe it's too high given the actual risks they took. That we might kind of look at, but this ability of firms in the US to take bigger risks, it's not because of their sort of risk lovingness. They're enabled to do that through these different types of taxpayer guaranteed schemes, which we don't necessarily have in Europe in the very, very early stage. Yeah. You're almost at the end, but Joel, yeah, on, this, I wanna, on this, on I, this. I too, I think, I'm not worried about the fact that innovation in the US or anywhere else is under incentivized, and therefore that we're providing too little of it. In fact, I think the main constraints about, on innovation are not on that side. They are actually on some of the problems that we're trying to solve are really, really difficult. You know, this, this, I mean, the, one of the main issues that everybody's worrying about is how to improve uh, energy storage, right? So battery technology is really a big deal. And you know, there are scores of firms working on this extremely hard. And the reason they're not making as much progress as we should is not because they think once they break through, the government is going to expropriate their profit. That, that's not going to happen. But it's, it's, a hard, it's a hard problem, and you know, we need you know, this, the, the actual physical issues are, 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 and chemical issues are, are really difficult. That's what's constraining progress. Now, you do put your finger on, on an important point, and that is there is resistance to technological change because they're always losers, right? It's never a, you know, a, a, a Pareto optimal system in the sense there are losers and the winners, and the losers don't always get compensated. That, I think, is when you ask me where is the role of government, it is to worry mm -hmm. about the losers. Mm -hmm. be, and because the losers will be able, as, or they will at least try, to block technological change. You know, we've seen this in England with the Luddites. We now see it so with see? European Uber drivers, I mean, taxi drivers. We see it all over the place. Government should, it's not that they should, they should squash this resistance, okay? But they should make it palatable for people mm. to live in an age of progress in which, unfortunately, not everybody Thank gains. You. So we have a last uh, polling question. That, uh, so can you, can you? Do you think that in, in the next 10 years, technological innovation will, A, replace more tasks than create new ones? So the net impact on employment will be negative. B. <laughs> create more tasks than replace all ones, so that the net impact on employment would be positive. C, have an insignificant net impact on employment. It's difficult. It's just it's difficult. difficult. One minute. While they're answering that. <laughs> <laughs> Joel, the biggest battery storage invention was from ARPA-E, given out. Also, uh, what? ARPA-E just came out with the biggest battery storage um, innovation six months ago. We, we closed it. Ten more seconds. So let's see, let's see the answers. We still, have, we still have one minute, one minute, yeah, we'll and then the, so question, we close on time. This question, but we should ignore well, I know, the supply I know, I know. of labor. I will submit it to you the next time. Yeah. Uh, no, but it ignores no. the supply side of yeah, labor. Yes, no, no, what you mentioned. <laughs> you know, David Ricardo was asking this already. Well, um, the same. Uh, but, but, uh, and I have a critique of this question as yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah. It should have wage in there. No, you can, you can. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's no supply yeah. side let's, here. Let's wait, let's wait, let's wait. What Maybe about wages? From this question. Yes, yes. That's maybe the conclusion. Yeah. So you will comment what comes out of this. All right. I think. So la uh, this is, this is last answers? OK, oh, uh, that's the result. Uh, you see? It's significant. Wow. You see? <laughs> yeah. So, no, that's, so. Diluted. OK. <laughs> Please. So. Let's conclude this panel. You want to comment on this very quickly? Well, yeah. 10, 20 seconds maximum for each on this. Mm -hmm. Maybe I, you show the results again. I have the same uh, critique of the question that, uh, that I raised before, namely, uh, what, about, what about wages? That's the real issue because, of course, if mm -hmm. supply yeah. of labor goes down, wages go up, people may consume some of that and having additional leisure. If you want. All sorts of yeah. things yeah. Could, uh, could happen. So it's not yeah. employment per se, but what uh, the interaction of employment and wages that matters. Good. So my yeah. quick 22nd point is David Ricardo, 1821, Chapter 31, on machinery. He asked that question. What actually happened for the next 200 years was that the profits being earned from innovation A were being reinvested in other parts of the economy. The big change has not been robots. Just think of the effect that mass production again had on jobs, wages, et cetera, the big change has been financialization from the 80s. What is happening to profits, not necessarily 
being reinvested, creating that renewal process. That's what today is hurting both skills formation, which is an endogenous function of investment, Next and time. new job creation. <laughs> it's not the Thank robots. You. Thank you. Yeah, it's you. In 19, if you ask somebody in 1914, are you worried about that, and then you told them that a century later their great-grandchildren would be a cybersecurity analyst and, game, and, 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 and computer game designers, they wouldn't have had the foggiest idea what you're talking about. We are going to create new occupations that we don't even dream about. Mm -hmm. Uh, any more than, say, people at the time of Ricardo could have known that the sons of the handloom weavers who were being thrown yeah. out of work would become railroad engineers and telegraph operators. Yeah, I need the profits the, were being reinvested. <laughs> yeah, I fully I agree. The there is lots of potential and lots of these ideas which we may not at this time already uh, be able to anticipate, but we also need to realize that all these potential effects will take a long term before they will actually be realized. So the long-term window that we need to take into account for evaluating these investments is coming. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well done. Very well done. Uh, oh, thank you. I'm, I'm surprised you guys don't buy this reinvestment thing. I think it's huge.